Hi everyone, this is Ezekiel O'Callaghan with Raptor Chatter, here to go across what happened in 2018 for paleontology. Now there have been a lot of finds and a few significant events that are going to impact the field, so let's get started. By using genetic data, scientists have been able to find that the last universal common ancestor of all life lived 3.9 billion years ago. By looking at parts of the DNA that aren't subject to evolutionary pressures, scientists can use the constant mutation rates of DNA to establish when species may have split. By taking DNA from a wide variety of different species, including bacteria, scientists have been able to establish that the last common ancestor of all life on Earth lived about 3.9 billion years ago, long before even basic functions of life today had even evolved, such as photosynthesis which only evolved 2.5 billion years ago. And now for a collection of papers which show that the marine reptiles which dominated the oceans during the Mesozoic were most likely warm-blooded. First, a massive jawbone from an ichthyosaur was found in England, and helped to show that the ichthyosaurs, even during the early parts of the Jurassic, were able to reach massive sizes, with this one almost approaching the size of a blue whale an indication that these species might have been warm-blooded so that they could attain such massive sizes in the ocean. Another study on plesiosaurs looked at their bones and found that they were very likely warm-blooded, as there were more vessels going through the bones to help promote faster growth. This in addition to the fact that plesiosaurs would only have one young and take a longer time to care for it so that it could grow to full size. Another indication of being warm-blooded. And finally, a new fossil of an ichthyosaur which shows skin and more importantly, blubber. Blubber being only found in warm-blooded animals, such as penguins, seals, polar bears, and even the leatherback turtle, arguably the world's only warm-blooded reptile. So far, the mosasaurs, which evolved later than the ichthyosaurs and the plesiosaurs, is the only group that we don't have evidence for living warm-blooded lifestyles. However, more evidence will tell as we continue to find more fossils. Deaconsonia was an animal, and this is unique as it helps us to know when animals first truly evolved. Deaconsonia was a small creature which lived on the ocean floor and seemingly didn't do very much, and it's been debated as to what it actually was. Arguments for the species' identity range from being a plant, an animal, or a fungus. And this year, scientists were able to help narrow down the mystery. Lipids were found in contact with the fossil. Specifically, the lipids that make up cholesterol, something that is inherently found in animals. And to be clear, these aren't the actual cholesterols the animal had when it was living, but rather just the leftover markers of cholesterol having been present. But it does help us narrow down when animal life truly first started over 550 million years ago. Verombe Titan is the largest bird known to have lived approaching nearly 860 kilograms, which is again approaching almost 1,900 pounds. This was a massive bird that dominated the forests of Madagascar, but it was an herbivore, and its extinction just a few hundred years ago helped to impact Madagascar in ways that we are still feeling. Because of its large size, it could transport seeds through its droppings across the island, helping the forest spread to a wide extent. Once humans arrived and began logging, they also caused the extinction of Verombe Titan and other large herbivores on the islands. This in turn caused the forests to not be able to rebound as quickly as we've tried to reduce the logging on Madagascar, showing how just one species or a few species can have a significant impact on an environment when they are no longer present due to extinction. The pterosaurs, like the famous Pteranodon, likely had feathers, or at least something very closely related to feathers. Scientists have known about pycnofibers since 1831, when August Goldfuss described Scaphognathus as having small, fur-like covering across its body. Scientists today now know that this fur-like covering could actually be quite advanced, and in fact much closer to feathers than we had ever thought. Two new pterosaur fossils coming from China show pycnofibers in incredible detail. Specifically, they show that there were four different types of the fiber and that they split along different lengths of the shaft of the fiber, which is something that is much more similar to feathers than to fur. This means that pterosaurs, for all intents and purposes, had feathers. And many scientists have said that if they had seen this same kind of covering, 
coming from a dinosaur, they would call it a feather. But since pterosaurs aren't dinosaurs, this opens a whole new host of questions. The first question would be, did the pterosaurs evolve these feathers or very feather-like structures independently, or did they inherit them from an ancestor? And if they did inherit these from an ancestor, could it be the same ancestor that they have with dinosaurs? Pterosaurs and the dinosaurs are very closely related, and so if their most common ancestor had feathers, that means all its descendants could have feathers, which means all dinosaurs could have feathers. And before people get excited saying all dinosaurs had feathers, there is still more to it than just that. We have skin impressions from species like Edmontosaurus and even Tyrannosaurus rex, which doesn't show much evidence of feathers. This means that not all dinosaurs had feathers, but many or most of them very well could have. Helping to shape our understanding of the Mesozoic world that dominated so many millions of years of the Earth's history. This year also saw a lot of evidence for pushing back the date of the first flowering plants. In Utah, a massive tree was found that was a flowering tree, much like the deciduous trees of today. This tree could have stood 50 meters tall, well over 100 feet. This tree comes from millions of years before other trees like it have been found, meaning that they were able to become very successful much more rapidly than previously thought. There was also an analysis on one of the earliest known flowering plants, Montsechia. This plant came from Spain and lived about 130 million years ago, and represents one of the first flowering plants that we know of. The analysis of it helps us to understand how it was more advanced than what we would expect to see in just some of the first. Due to its widespread abundance in the formation, and its similarities to other early flowering plants, Montsechia may have been one of the best examples for the first flowering plants that we've seen, meaning that Montsechia coming from an aquatic environment may be one of the first steps that we took towards having our modern day grains and fruits on which we rely. Butterflies today are known for pollinating flowering plants, but new evidence suggests they evolved well before that. As I mentioned with Montsechia, it evolved 130 million years ago. But new microfossils of butterfly scales from Germany are much older than that, coming from the Triassic over 220 million years ago. Now these early butterflies, or stem butterflies, likely weren't eating off of flowers that had evolved that we haven't found the fossils of. Rather, they were more likely eating the sap and pollen that has been generally released by plants like the cycads and ginkgos that we still see today. This then could have led some of these plants to concentrate their saps and pollens into specific locations in order to help spread it. This then could have evolved into the flowers, meaning that the butterfly's first evolutionary steps 220 plus million years ago could have led to the flowers and plants that we have today. Trees struggle under UVB radiation. A team of scientists looked to see how the seeds of certain conifers would adapt when placed under intense amounts of UVB radiation. What the scientists found mirrors what we see in the fossil record of the Permian extinction, the most extensive extinction of all time. Trees during this time period had the same kind of malformities and mutations that caused sterility that we saw in the modern day trees that were exposed to high levels of UVB radiation. This just shows the key importance that should be placed on the ozone layer which helps to protect the planet from this UVB radiation and allows us to continue growing many of the plants that we rely on. With the Montreal Protocol being signed in the 1980s, the ozone layer has seen more protections. However, recent studies also suggest that it hasn't been recovering at the expected rate because of continued pollution. So please be aware of this and try and reduce pollution as much as you can, either be it personally or through trying to convince more action to stop it on a global scale. 2018 also saw the discovery of many new early sauropods, some of which give us great insights into how they became so large during the Jurassic period. Lemu Mahadi Mafube and Ingentia Prima are two examples of these, both of which being very large. And Lemu Mahadi lived during the early Jurassic period and is much larger than its contemporary sauropodiforms and sauropodomorphs. This helps to show how after the Triassic extinction, the sauropods were able to start expanding to massive sizes very rapidly. And Lemu Mahadi helps to show how they were already preparing for that type of body plan. Lemu Mahadi weighed well over 12 tons, 
but it didn't have the same kind of columnar legs we see in later species of sauropods, instead having bent legs like most of the other dinosaurs. This shows how they were already pushing the limits of what they could do with their bodies as far as size is concerned, even before the Triassic extinction, and goes to show how they were able to become so successful immediately after that period to become the dominant herbivores of the period. And there were other findings on top of this, like the prosauropod Macrocolum itaqui, which is notable in having a significantly longer neck than the other prosauropods that lived in its environment, such as Buriolestes, which lived just a few million years beforehand. These adaptations, the long neck of Macrocolum and the larger sizes of Ledumahati and Ingentia, help us to understand how the sauropods were able to become so massive during the Jurassic, so massive that they became the largest animals to ever walk the earth. In smaller dinosaurs, Kaihang Juji was described from China. Although small, its fine preservation helped us understand what it would have looked like. Using electron microscopes, scientists can analyze the preserved feathers in the rock to find fossilized melanosomes, the parts of the cells that give color. The melanosomes in Kaihang Juji's feathers most resemble those of species like our modern day hummingbirds, meaning that Kaihang Juji would have had very bright iridescent plumage. Kaihang Juji is also one of the earliest known feathered dinosaurs, and its iridescence shows that feathers were already fairly advanced by the time it lived 160 million years ago, pushing the true origin of feathers back to significantly before that time. A new tyrannosaur had also been described from New Mexico, called Dynamoterror Dynasties, because apparently all tyrannosaurs just need intimidating names. Dynamoterra dynasties was small when compared to Tyrannosaurus rex, but was sized similarly to related species that lived in Utah, such as Teratophonius and Lythronax. These two species were very closely related to Dynamoterra, and helped to show how these small enclaves that formed on the coast of the Great Inland Sea during the Cretaceous led to massive amounts of speciation, as each of these small enclaves seemingly had their own slightly different type of tyrannosaur. Fossils from the time of dinosaurs are exceedingly rare on the east coast of the United States, but that doesn't mean that they are entirely absent. Arkansasaurus was described this year, an ornithomimid dinosaur coming from Arkansas. It helps to show how similar the different parts of the continent were during the Cretaceous, when the Great Inland Seaway split the continent in two. Additionally, there was a large fossil slab of footprints coming from Maryland. The slab shows a wide variety of different species, including very small mammals, which helps us to understand how life actually looked during the Mesozoic and the Cretaceous, as mammal fossils were largely smaller and more prone to breaking during fossilization. The combination of these finds and their comparisons towards what we know about the western United States during the same time period helps us to understand what the east coast of the United States looked like during the age of dinosaurs, as it is very rare that we make these kinds of finds in the United States. The origins of spiders has been fairly well known for a while, specifically that they branched off of a group very similar to today's modern day vinegaroons or whip scorpions. The arachnids in this group are sometimes called vinegaroons because they produce acetic acid as a form of defense, a major component of vinegar. The group between the vinegaroons and the true spiders, though, was thought to have gone extinct during the Permian extinction 252 million years ago, leaving behind only weak fossil evidence of what they actually may have looked like and behaved like. A new fossil, though, from Cretaceous Burma only 100 million years ago shows that they did survive the Permian extinction, and quite well beyond it. The species, named Chimera rachnae yingi, shows many features of both the groups, such as a long tail, much like the whip scorpions and vinegar runes have, but also spinnerets, a defining feature of the spiders, helping us to understand how very similar species and groups may or may not succeed in the face of extinction, as Chimera rachnae and the rest of its group did die out before the modern day. Before the mammals, there were the stem mammal ancestors, and a lot of debate has been had over how similar they were to the true mammals. A new find this year shows that they weren't actually that similar in at least one major way. Chiantotherium was found 
and it was found with a large collection of its young. Specifically, there were 38 young that this Chianthotherium had with it when it was found. And this is widely out of proportion for what we see in modern day mammals, when you have things like mice, which still only produce maybe 14 to 15 young at the maximum. This means that somewhere along the evolutionary line of mammals, a significant decrease in the number of young animals raised at the time occurred. And the authors suggest that this is due to a metabolism shift in the early mammals. Chianthotherium is just before what we see in the true mammals, and it had a smaller brain case than the true mammals. As the mammals developed larger brains, they would need to dedicate more of their metabolism to supporting that brain. And the same is true in the young, where the same number of resources would be dedicated to fewer offspring in order to develop that more advanced spring than the earlier stem mammals. Human activity during the Pleistocene's ice ages has been a point of contention for many scientists, with many arguing that human-caused activity brought the extinction of many of the species that made the time period so iconic, and others arguing that human activity couldn't have caused all of the extinctions that we see during the period, as there isn't enough evidence of human hunting on many of the species only species like Mastodon and a few of the bison. This year, another group was added, with evidence of human hunting being found in the ground sloths. Footprints from White Sands, New Mexico, show a ground sloth avoiding the pursuit of human hunters. In a number of places, the ground sloth rears up onto its hind legs and seemingly pivots in place, trying to fend off the human attackers. We don't know the outcome of this hunt, as the footprints trail off and are no longer preserved towards the later end of the hunt. But the evidence that humans were very directly hunting giant ground sloths is just another piece of evidence that humans did cause a lot of the extinctions that we see during the end of the Ice Age. Although 2018 was a great year for paleontological finds, there was also a lot of sadness this year. The National Museum of Brazil burned down during the summer, with scientists trying to save as many specimens as they could by going into the burning building and pulling them out themselves. Unfortunately, many of the fossils were lost in the fire, but some were pulled from the wreckage, such as Luzia, the oldest human fossil found in the Americas. This is combined with the closing of the Jura Museum in Germany, which was made for the specific limestone formation that houses many famous fossils, such as Archaeopteryx. While right now only temporary, the shutdown may be permanent due to a lack of funding. Both of these cases show why it's important to go out and fund your local museums so that we don't have the same kind of loss to science that we had last year in the future. And finally, Bears Ears National Monument and Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument have had their borders greatly reduced. This leaves many of the fossils that have been found there open to damage from poachers or from mining companies, which have been allowed in the area. The lost science from the reduction of these monuments is significant, as these monuments cover two of the largest extinctions that we know of. One during the end of the Cretaceous, which killed off the non-avian dinosaurs and many other species, and the other, arguably more important, at the end of the Permian, the most severe extinction of all time. Michael Benton wrote a paper this past year, which discussed what caused the extinction to be so severe and found that it was largely due to climate change. A large formation of coal was lit on fire by a volcanic activity and released massive amounts of CO2 into the air. That caused climate change, which also caused ocean acidification. Drought killed many species on land, and in the oceans, almost nothing survived. This is very much mirroring what we have today, where continued CO2 pollution from the burning of fossil fuels is endangering our own environment. The reduction of these monuments threatens our ability to study these time periods and understand what we can do to prevent similar extinctions from happening today. So please, support the actions being taken by some of the Native American tribes who called these monuments their ancestral lands and the scientists who want to preserve the science that can be found there. Support these efforts to keep the monuments safe and open for the scientists so that we can understand our past in an even better capacity so that we can help our future. Hi everyone, thanks for watching. There's been a lot of ups and downs this year for paleontology. Lots of great finds, but some really unfortunate events 
for the museums and with the reduction of the national monuments. So hopefully we can work on making sure this kind of thing doesn't happen again in the future. As a reminder, we are gonna have an announcement in the next few weeks to try and help the paleo community. So keep on the lookout for that as we continue to get more videos out. And finally, just remember to be safe, take care, and don't go extinct.